Right, good evening, everybody. Uh, can you hear okay at the back? Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming along uh, to this event this evening. Uh, it's a beautiful evening out there, so we really appreciate everyone turning up. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Of course, we've got Simon Cole here to talk to us, and he's going to talk probably for about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. And there'll be plenty of time at the end of that to, to uh, ask questions. I want to just say a few quick words, I'm not going to delay it very long. Firstly, to say this is jointly organised. DICE, which of course Sarinda and John here play a key role in, but also the Race Equality Centre and Civic Leicester have had a role in pulling this talk together as well. So we appreciate the engagement with them. It's great to be able to get organisations in the city involved in some of the things that we do on campus. And it's nice to see that we've got a real variety of people, both from the university here in the audience, but also others from uh, the city and wider. Um, Simon, I think most people in the room probably know a bit about Simon's background. Uh, Chief Commissioner, of course, uh, Chief Constable, sorry, of Leicestershire here. Grew up in Leicestershire, I think. Yeah. Grew up in Leicester. Um, Colour blind, I think I got that off his website, which I shared with him. Uh, but I never tried to get in the police. You got rejected, I think, to, <laughs> to begin with. Uh, more seriously, Simon has worked on a whole range of different portfolios within the police force and has gained a, a national reputation, particularly for the work he's done on mental health, uh, he sits on the Prime Minister's group on dementia, so he's looked in, I, I think a lot of the time in his career is focused on looking at groups of people who are going to have problems during their careers and think about ways to, to get through that. I don't know if some of those issues may or may not come up today. Um, of course, the other thing that Simon's very well known for recently is Simon is the national lead on the prevent strategy, and of course that's a big issue for universities, our students and staff are involved in prevent in a sense because we uh, we have a national policy which again Simon knows much better than we do but as far as we're concerned it's a very productive relationship that we have uh, with Simon and the groups of people who are involved locally but we'll hear more about that I think as time goes on. Uh, he is also visiting, uh, comes to our uh, university quite regularly because he gives lectures in criminology so a visiting fellow in our department of criminology. I know Simon, I think I met Simon first uh, at the rugby field, and it was my children playing, not me, and Simon, I think, spends a lot of time outside of his uh, formal role, engaging in a variety of different community uh, groups, including, I think it's OB Wiggs that he coaches at, but also I think he's had a role with the guides and the scouts and various other things. So he plays a, quite a significant role, not just in the police force, but trying to engage with the community in a variety of different ways. Um, We'll have to see how tonight's lecture goes, of course, because there's a whole range of issues, I think, that are very interesting, both to the university and also to the community. And as I said, Simon's going to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, but give us plenty of time to have questions at the end. So do think about questions you'd like to ask, and I'll, I'll host the questions at the very end, and please make sure you've got lots of things you'd like to discuss at the very end. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Simon. Thank you very much indeed for coming along, Simon. We really appreciate it. Sorry I'm late, but I, I failed Quentin Rayner's can you answer this concisely test quite badly, so I've just had to do that about four times. And I'm, so, some of you heard me speak the other day at the Secular Society, so I apologise for any repetition or radical difference. Um, uh, I feel a bit like I've been set an exam question. So, yeah, policing a multiracial city, uh, what I'm going to say really is I feel we are the social glue that keeps sometimes that city together. In saying that, I wouldn't want to lose sight of the fact that we also police not one but two counties, one of them which is very small, um, and you could have an interesting discussion with the Isle of Wight about whether it's the smallest county or not. There's something about whether the tide's in or out on the Isle of Wight as to whether it is or not. Um, and I'm happy to be pretty candid, I'm happy to be pretty warts and all, especially when the BBC camera goes. Uh, and. A framework for me in thinking about this kind of issue is the oath that we take, which I'll come to in a minute, the code of ethics that we uh, aspire to, and the Human Rights Act, um, and something that I personally believe, I would guess we might be the biggest users of the Human Rights Act in Leicestershire. We use it every day arguably on every job, and certainly on the big jobs, written assessment, does this comply with the Human Rights Act? And when I'm authorising surveillance and things like that, I actually have to write down what rights I'm engaging, why, and why I believe they can be compromised. So 
I'm really happy at the end to have discussion and questions. As Paul alluded to in the introduction, this is a topic that's kind of out there. If I don't talk about something that you want to talk about, I'm really happy to pick it up at the end. Um, a start point is this. Um, my staff officer has been torturing me all week with this. I now can nearly do all of those different flags. My quiz question for you is, what do you think those flags represent? No, you've got to speak up. <laughs> Hi. Different nationalities in Leicester. The different nationalities in Leicester? Leicestershire and Rutland. Leicestershire and Rutland. Ooh, what made you say Rutland was in there? That wasn't in Leicester. Leicester and Leicestershire. Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, a quarter of the population of Leicester is Irish. Irish. Um, Leicester and Rutland are the Irish Isles. Irish Isles. Yeah. Um, Irish Isles. Yeah. Um, according to self-determined identification by people in Leicestershire Police, those are the countries that are represented in Leicestershire Police. To different amounts. We haven't got too many Dutch people, I understand. Um, and I will talk in a bit about the kind of numbers. Um, and I'm also going to really argue that actually we police a place that's so diverse, it is now, I think, impossible to produce a person who can represent all the characteristics that you need someone to represent to do the job. Uh, but a start point, the oath. So, in the room are a couple of colleagues. One of them has taken the oath and one of them hasn't, uh, because about a third of the people in Leicestershire Police are staff. Uh, and then the other two thirds are police officers. And we have to start by taking an oath. Uh, and the oath has changed a couple of times in my service, but the core of it is about fairness about integrity, diligence, impartiality, upholding human rights, that wasn't there when I joined because human rights hadn't been invented in Birmingham in 1988. Um, keep the peace, prevent offences and do it to the best of your ability and I think uh, those of you in the room who do jobs and things that involve dealing with people, that can be quite difficult sometimes and all I can ask of people and they're out there now dealing with stuff is that they do it to the best of their ability. Um, that is something that I can only say for me, when I took that oath, I really meant it. And it was a key, iconic moment in my life. Uh, and I stood up in a room in Birmingham, because because I'm colourblind, Leicestershire had rejected me. And I took that oath with uh, 80 other people, magistrates have to come and do it. It is something that underpins what people are trying to do. Does everybody keep it? Of course they don't, because we're human. Is it something to aspire to? Is it something to remember when it's really difficult? Absolutely, yes it is. You'll find the kind of people who are important enough in our organisation to have an office, quite often that's the thing on the office wall, because it is a kind of touchstone. And I labour it because that means that all the people that join our organisation <coughs> one of the first things that they have to rehearse and understand is what does fairness mean, what does integrity mean, what does diligence mean, what does impartiality mean, what are these human rights we're trying to uphold and the biggest test of policing always is that we are perceived as fair um, and I'm going to use an example now that two or three of you in the room heard me use the other day and it really upset somebody in the room but I'm still going to use it again, fox hunting. This is an emotional topic, you were there you, you were there, you were there. Sometimes, if I've got about the same levels of complaint that we're biased from both sides of that debate, I think we're probably about right. Because <laughs> that's about being fair. Being fair can't mean everybody gets their own way. And that's a really interesting challenge for us and we kind of walk the line. I'm not gonna sing Johnny Cash for those of you who are familiar with that, but we walk the line, and that line is walked based on that. Um, and what are we dealing with? And um, I was talking to someone earlier, a senior colleague, and we concluded that we did deal with lots of stuff that really, we actually had a discussion about the nice things we'd done at the weekend after we had a discussion about all the other things that we were looking at. You know, where have we walked the line, particularly around policing a multiracial city? Where is the line between the freedom of expression to express a view 
and the freedom to protest or express an alternative view. At what point, um, if a riot is the sound of the unheard or whatever Martin Luther King said, at what point is that a legitimate social process or at what point is that criminology, crimin, criminal? Um, you know, we've seen the rise in recent weeks and months, really sadly, of terrorism. Real, real terrorism, real difficult issues, apparently motivated by far-right extremism in some cases, apparently motivated by an Islamist view in other cases. And on that slide as well, I could have put up knife crime, which I spent quite a chunk of this afternoon talking about uh, with partners. We could be talking about antisocial behaviour. We could be talking about anything that comes up in the 600,000 phone calls that we take a year. So, you know, what we're dealing with is often life in the raw, and when people, occasionally misguided people perhaps, but they say to me, oh, you know, what, what did you do? And particularly people who are thinking of joining, I always say, you will see life in the raw. You will, you know, you'll get punched, you'll get spat at, you'll get kicked, you'll get abused. You'll see really nice people who've had horrible things happen to them. You'll deal with people absolutely ethically and properly who you probably don't feel deserve that. You will absolutely see life in the raw. In the raw. And of course, just to put some numbers around the place and looking around the audience, yeah, I know lots of you know the city intimately. Yeah, these are the numbers based on uh, some recent national data. We police, and it is mostly a privilege and a pleasure to police, um, one of the most diverse cities, you could argue, in Europe. Um, that means that faith is really important. Some of you in the room have met and discussed issues around faith. What is the role of faith in a community? What's the role of the council? What's the role of the council of faiths? <coughs> yeah. So faith is really important. As chief, one of the great things about being chief is I get to celebrate every faith's significant happy events on a nice spread across the whole year. But that also means you have to deal with some of the challenges. You know, and what does this kind of thing mean? And uh, you know, A couple of Sundays ago, I had a really nice Sunday out. Really nice. I went to the Oval and I watched cricket. And I saw India play Pakistan. And it was great. The trains back weren't great. At nine o'clock, as I stood on Luton Station, waiting hopefully for something that might resemble a train, I got my duty commander phoning saying, we've got a bit of a problem here, boss. And we finished walking the line between people celebrating, in one case, and not happy about the way the celebration was being done in the other. And I had six police officers injured, none of them badly, I'm pleased to say, and we had to mobilise people from other forces to walk that line. Um, really interesting from reactions to that. Um, some of the reactions which tell you more about the communities we police. I mean, a couple of weeks before when India had won and they'd been, the street had been shut off because people were dancing in the street, I had a number of people who I would guess are probably from the right of the political spectrum contact me saying, you wouldn't let football fans do that. You'd be straight in and you're favouring these people because they're not white. Um, interesting. Now, the Daily Mail claim that. That may or may not impress you. Um, whether Narborough Road is or isn't the most diverse street in the UK, my challenge as chief is to be able to put people in a rather bright yellow jacket into that street who can deal with whatever comes their way. That is an interesting challenge. That means that the people that we ask to do that have to be culturally sensitive, culturally aware. They have to be on their toes. They have to be aware of what's happening in the rest of the world. And I think it also challenges a bit the kind of narrative, and I will come to some numbers around diversity and our, our own makeup. You know, the notion that there's one person that can walk down that road and make everybody feel reassured, I think is a really interesting challenge. Um, I'm not sure 
that that's completely achievable. Um, and I'm very aware in saying that. I'm a white, middle class, middle aged, slightly older than middle aged guy. Um, but, you know, Narborough Road, I travel through it quite regularly, not a million miles away from headquarters. Yeah. How do you police that community in a way that they all buy into you, that they trust you, that they're prepared to share with you? It is quite an art form. Um, and some of our people are brilliant at that. And, you know, bless those of you who know up on the Matthews, uh, Reg Varney, who just got the BEM in the honours list, um, a really welcomed by all communities beat Bobby. He's only been there 16 years to earn that kind of trust. So there's a thing for us about longevity, trust building and skills. There must be some sort of charity fine for that. <laughs> um, I know I've been asked to speak about a multi-ethnic city particularly, but, but a point I would also make is there are other diversities and some of them I've kind of left out deliberately. But I also think there's a diversity around social experiences. Um, Houghton on the Hill and Broadson Park are not a million miles apart. Eight miles apart, nine miles apart, something like that. Imagine if you are the cop sent to a job here, how what happens might be different to if you're the cop sent to a job there. Um, completely different social experiences, possibly completely different life opportunities, probably quite a different demographic look if you were looking at race. There is a real challenge for us, which is a challenge that we welcome, which is we police a place that is incredibly diverse. Um, over the weekend, I was dealing with my in-tray, because my work-life balance isn't very good, um, and I literally dealt consecutively with an issue which was around the prevent agenda, and the next issue was a man who lives in Melton Mowbray who has problems with kids cycling on the path outside his house. Now, I'm not diminishing his issues, because they're really real, and they're the biggest thing that he's been so concerned about it, he's written to the chief constable about it. But, there's a relativity thing sometimes, which is a challenge, and those kind of figures suggest a different kind of diversity. I mean, the life expectancy stuff is still 10 years different. 10 years different, it's really pretty stark stuff. Now, does that work? It probably, it's probably quite hard to read. I will do the guided tour of this. Uh, this is a, t a typical day <coughs> in Leicestershire Police. Uh, and if we start at kind of 11 o'clock, so the population now, over a million people, grown by double figures percentage over the last decade. Um, in a typical day, if I just work through the top quadrant, in a typical day, bearing in mind, I often get told I never see the police anymore. We only do 16,660 miles a day in, on patrol in vehicles. Um, so we must be quite hard to spot uh, doing that in our bright cars with light yellow and blue squares all over them and blue flashing lights on the top. Um, typical day, 10 CCTV items need seizing, 12 mobile devices need examining, I work round here. Since 2010, recorded reported crime has dropped by about 17%, but the harm caused by the crimes we're dealing with has increased by about 10%. That's using a piece of academic work called the Cambridge Harm Index, which looks at the harm that offences cause to people. So the harm's gone up, but the number's gone down. We've delivered £38 million worth of savings since 2010 which means I've got 547 fewer police officers than I had the day I walked in the door. Gone down from 2,300 to just around 1,800 now. Using the harm index, 0.7%, so 0.7% of people experience 80% of the harm that goes on. Why? Repeat victims of child abuse, repeat victims of domestic abuse. And there was some work done by colleagues in Manchester who worked out particular police attendance at one particular family and worked out that if they had posted one police officer in the front lounge of that family for the whole year, it would have been cheaper than the number of times that they'd been to that house. 
So there's some interesting kind of, where do we put our people? Typical day, 190 crimes, 24 of which are domestic abuse related, four sexual offences, 18 shopliftings, um, five people driving off without petrol, five and a half thousand hours, without paying for petrol, sorry, uh, five and a half thousand hours spent policing football, um, some of which we get paid for, some of which we don't. The bottom quadrant over here, missing people, 13 people a day reported missing to us. Four locations make up 10% of all of those. Every one of them costs us an average of two and a half thousand pounds to find in terms of resources. Seven children account for 20% of our missing people. So there's a really interesting thing about where our service goes. So from my perspective, should I just sit a cop by the front door of those four premises? Because that might be the business answer. It might not be the best answer for a vulnerable child. And then just working around, you know, in a typical day, and then I'll unpack some of this. About 1,800 calls, phone calls, that's a bit higher at the moment. Uh, 725 incidents, it says. So that means, as a consequence of calls, 725 things we attend. Currently, we're running over 900 a day. And frankly, the model is creaking, because if you model for 725 jobs a day, and your demand goes up to 900. I was with the ambulance chief earlier, he's just seeing exactly the same thing. So demand is going up and up and up. About 71% of what we do in a typical day is not about crime. So it is around vulnerability, concerns for welfare, and that's the context of a typical day. How, many, how long's left of it today? Six hours more of it, five and a half hours more of it. Uh, that's what colleagues will be dealing with. And sorry, the middle bit, just really quickly. There's about 1,600 high-risk domestic abuse victims, mostly but not exclusively female. Um, a referral a day around child sexual exploitation and about 1,300 sex offenders who are being managed in the community. And that number is going to grow because of the internet and we're able to basically catch more people because of what they leave on the internet. So that's a typical day and that's the context for all that we're saying. And this is us. Um, some of you have seen me talk to this before. So, 1,700 cops, 250 PCSOs, police staff, if you call us your forensics, someone earlier was saying about wanting to be a forensics person, uh, when I joined the job, which was a long time ago, forensic examiners were cops. They're now almost exclusively, 99% of them, the staff, 80,000 hours of volunteer patrol from specials, huge increase in volunteering, and obviously, and lots of you live and work around here, Strategic Road Network, the M1, we are ideally placed to shut Britain down, and I'm sadly had to do that a couple of times, and uh, East Midlands Airport, which is a real interesting driver of demand. I was up there the other day. Um, the nighttime economy stuff we do in the city, we're actually doing a mini version of that, you know, get, go up there when the stag dudes are going out on a Friday morning, um, they're not shy about having a beer. Obviously, I've never done that on a stag do myself, ever. <laughs> or, or rugby tour. So, uh, the next few slides are about some of the grittier stuff and stuff that maybe we'll want to talk about. So, just under 10% of the force self-identify as being from an ethnic minority. Our cadets and our special constables are more diverse than the regular force. Um, so that's about 10%, which in a world where half the city we police, broadly speaking, uh, would probably consider itself to be a minority, yeah, this is a number we need to lift. And we'll maybe come, I'll come to some of that in a minute. Um, Self-identified as disabled, about 4%. Uh, female, about 42%. Officers, about 28, 29% of officers are female. Uh, our staff are more female than male. And then uh, people who consider themselves to be bisexual, transsexual, or, or gay or lesbian is about 2%, um, although most people preferred not to say. So that's our diversity. Police and Crime Commissioner, a uh, worry here, would say, I need you to work more on that diversity. We are really keen that we look like the place that we police, that we sound like the place that we police, that we're able to engage with the place that we police. But it isn't going to be a magic bullet. 
and I'll explain why in a minute. So what are we trying to do with our recruitment? And the picture's chosen, I'll be dead straight. I, 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 I said to my office, this is what I'm going to say, do, 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 do. put some pictures around it. So Izzy at the top there is, is Polish and, and speaks a rather splendid brand of, of, of Polish. You know, random set of pictures to illustrate the point. We try to take our recruitment out into the community, but a challenge that we have had over recent years is that recruitment can't be the answer to everything because we haven't been recruiting. Because, because of the squeeze on our budgets, so in taking £38 million pounds out, we spend 85p in every pound on a person, so recruiting isn't the answer. And I've been in a meeting again today where depending on what happens to our budget over the next couple of years, and there's some political decisions need taking there, yeah, our recruiting might squeeze down. Um, at the moment, we're taking about 80 or 90 recruits a year uh, to replace the 80 or 90 people that retire in a typical year as police officers. We've tried to push into our specialist departments, which were very male and very white. Um, so we want to see more women, more people from diverse backgrounds with guns. We want those on our public order vans. Um, We've tried to do all the kind of things I think big organisations do around giving people the opportunity to go and see what it's like, spend time there. Promotion, um, we have a challenge at the top end of policing, which is the candidate pool is mostly male and mostly white. Uh, and that means however much you might want to pick someone from a different diverse background, uh, then if they're not there in the first place, you can't. We're trying to encourage people to develop, develop their skills, develop their confidence through the PDRs. And we're trying to recruit on a more network basis because we have, I mean, being sort of, there's a bit of brutal economics in this. If we, when we put out an advert for COPS the other month, we got about 10 applicants for every job we've got. As an employer, at that point, we could just decide Hey, we've got 10 applicants for every job. But we have still tried to work, and there's a picture on there, about getting out into local communities, going to different places, talking about what the job is, explaining it is a professional job with a good career structure, explaining that if you are someone of potential, we may be able to help you develop and get what's now being talked about as a degree standard uh, of, uh, of academia. Or if you've got a degree, as I had when I joined, that you can come in and it is a career that you can aspire into. But we need to get better at this, but the context of getting better is in a controlled era of recruitment, which is code for, we might not be recruiting as many going ahead, budget dependent. How do we look after the people within the job? Well. What we try to do is create a network of support. Uh, we've also been asked in recent weeks to create a, a Hindu support network, and we will do that. Uh, all of the people that run these networks would say they'd like more time and more budget, but so would the chief constable to run the organisation, so he has to kind of share these things out. But these are really important networks for us that enable people to feel supported, enable people to identify, to identify role models, to have a place to go if they've got a problem, for people like me to ask a question of, how should I deal with this particular issue? Um, the Women's Next Network, WIN at the bottom there, they had a conference last week hosted at another local university, very generously accommodated as they did. Um, I think we paid for the drinks. Um, but over 200 people sat down, uh, there were some sessions with inspirational speakers, there were some workshop sessions about things that could be done. Um, my sense as the person that opened it and got there to close or be the present for the close of it was that it, it was a room that was bouncing full of energy and useful actual real things will come out of that. And there are others in the room who were there. So the support networks exist. So for instance, in recent months when I've been to meet with senior figures from the Muslim faith community, the Association of Muslim Police have come along and talked a bit about this is what we do, this is what we've experienced, this is how we can help, we're happy to be a conduit uh, between the police and yourself. But the idea is they're support networks that help people within the organisation and also speak truth unto power and tell people like me, well, that's why that's happening. 
And this is what you can do about it. Now, gritty topics, stop and search. Um, I have a slightly personal view, which is that here in Leicester, this is a debate that is perhaps slightly less current than it once was, but this is where we were. In fact, my very first letter on my very first day as Chief Constable was from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, kindly, kindly pointing out to me that I could go to prison unless I sorted out the disproportionate use of stop and search in the force in their view, which was a lovely first letter. I thought, that looks official, that would be nice. <laughs> it wasn't. You can see there, you know, stop and search, one in ten led to arrest. Uh, records weren't great. Uh, what is a reasonable ground to, to, to search somebody, which is what, what the law talks about. We've moved on. We're now doing five searches a day. Really interesting now in the context of knife crime. Some noise we're hearing from some people within communities is you're not doing enough stops. And that people are carrying knives because they don't have the fear that they might be stopped. Grounds for uh, leading to arrest, significantly gone up. It's almost doubled. Um, better quality of what is done, race proportionality, disproportionality is still there. Uh, for the black guys, it's about times four more likely than a white guy. Uh, for Asian, it's now almost exactly the same. Um, so we've done lots and lots of work. We have, I mean, it, it's called the ride-along scheme. We had to give up on that because we don't do enough. If we put you with one of my cops for the day and said, go and watch them do a stop and search, they probably aren't going to do one. So instead, what we've been doing is using body-worn video, and they record every stop and search that's done, and we have a lay panel that watches those stop and searches and says, that one was done really well, tell police feedback to the officer, or that one wasn't done very well at all, it was insensitive, the search didn't look very good, and whatever. So there's a kind of feedback loop around that. But five a day is interesting in a population of a million people. Um, and still quite often, when I speak to public audiences, I get stop and search raised, I think the debate, we need to move on. My worry is we don't quite do enough of this. Yeah. And particularly if you look at the knife crime issues uh, that we're facing at the moment, is stop and search, it's never the answer on its own, but could it be a deterrent? Uh, because of course the other thing I would say, and I would say this wouldn't I, because I'm a cop, it's all I've done in my adult life. I don't think arrest is the only measure of stop and search. It's also intelligence, it's who you get to talk to, it's a rapport, it's a bit of information you get past. An arrest has become the litmus test for it. I don't think it necessarily is the only thing that comes out of stop and search. Prevent. Now I lead for prevent uh, nationally for policing, so I'm responsible for how the prevent duty is carried out uh, within the world of policing. Um, and. It is a contentious issue. Often what it's, the things that people say are contentious are things that actually aren't really within prevent, um, is my personal view, uh, but I'm happy to explore that. Um, quite often, and the Home Office actually did it the other week, they did a really nice thing about prevent, which they accompanied with a picture of an officer with a gun. Uh, that's prevent in action. It's a safeguarding panel. Uh, it's chaired by a member of the local authority. Uh, for Leicester, uh, that's someone that works for Leicester City Council. We contribute to that with what we know of individuals. And you can see there, this year, 136 referrals to the police team. Uh, 63 of those, we would suggest, is of an Islamist ideology. 15 of those around extreme right wing, or anti-Semitic, or anti-Islamist. And the others, don't fit conveniently into a box, and lots of these don't. In general terms, a third of the referrals go nowhere. A third of the referrals have some other form of sort of social working input, if I call it that, so traditional social working, and a third go to a channel panel which looks like that. You can tell it's in a public sector building, there's no pictures left on the wall. <coughs> so, Things that get forgotten around prevent, it is a voluntary scheme. 
if you are referred and you don't want to be part of it, you can say, I'm not going to cooperate with this. It is a safeguarding scheme. That's what it is. And it gets lost in lots of other noise. And of course, I would argue at the moment, two things. One is, it's never been more important. The other is, I believe it to be in a, a fine tradition, a liberal tradition, by that I don't mean the political party, which is around safeguarding and trying to support people. Anything else that we're going to talk about this evening, if we were talking about robbery, knife crime, antisocial behaviour, I think probably all of us would want a start point to be, let's try and divert people away from this rather than be punitive. And there's always a point where punitive becomes and people need locking away, and I'm a great believer in that. And of course, in all of this context, the prisons are full, which is an interesting thought for us all. This is just part of that. What do we want to do with the teenage kid who we think has been looking at some beheading videos? What do we think we should do with them? Because I think we should give them a chance and try and help them and support them. And we're not always the best people to do that because we're the police. And that's all prevent is. But the noise around prevent won't say that. And let's be sort of blunt. The predominant terrorist threat at the moment is Islamists. That's why the referrals are as they are. When I joined policing, it was Irish terrorism. Prevent wasn't invented then. But if it had to be, I would kind of guess it was probably would have been referrals around Irish people. So it's not perfect. There should be more transparency around the data, um, particularly, I would say, from the government. Um, but you know, I'm really happy to rehearse Prevent because it's such an important issue at the moment. Other things. So in a context of 20,000 incidents a month, we get, those are the numbers for hate crime. Significantly underreported, I would venture to suggest, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, a lack of faith in us, a lack of faith in the justice system. Sometimes we have to point out to people that what they've experienced isn't just day to day, the way communities rub along with each other, it's actually a hate crime or a hate incident. Um, Alternative subculture, a relatively new addition. And you can see there the predominant issue that we're dealing with is, is race. We do see these, these reports lift after significant incidents that people, so after the terrorist incidents of recent weeks, you know, we are monitoring that very closely. And there clearly is more tension. You'll be aware last year there was a vote around Brexit. I don't know if anyone noticed that. You know, around that significant uplift in reporting of uh, incidents to us. 25% uh, positive outcome rate. Detections are old money now. We're into positive outcomes. Satisfaction rate, 72%, which is pretty similar to the overall, it's a little bit below the overall satisfaction rate for um, uh, all crime that we deal with. So, Huge underreported, there are options for third party reporting, things like True Vision. Um, <coughs> you can also online report stuff to us. I mean, in the audience is, is Lynn, who's involved in our diversity team, we might be able to throw some, some insight on that as well. Something we take really seriously, something we've trained our people to try and recognise and try and understand. And a hate crime is, is anything that anyone involved in it thinks is motivated by hate. Uh, so the definition is pretty broad. Of course, the other people who experience hate crime is police officers. So one of the really interesting things in having a more diverse workforce is this excellent study by the University of Leicester, um, which I don't think we've ever publicly said it was based on Leicester Police, but was based on Leicester Police. Uh, where a number of colleagues did qualitative interviews with your research team to talk about their experiences. <laughs> that was probably the only quote in the whole report that I could put on front of an audience that didn't feature appalling language. So one of the really interesting things is that if you join the police and you're different in any way, the public pick on you about it. To the point where for some of these people, this is a pretty, it's on, you can read the report, I think it's online, um, you know, it's a pretty grim read and it wears away at people um, and as the quote there, I mean I happen to know the person that gave that quote whatever your appearance is 
I used to get it from Birmingham. I was, I was posh, skinny, didn't have glasses at that point. You get a bit, and it's quite a difficult one to deal with because it rubs away at your people. Um, and put that into Narborough Road. I think we could probably all think of a reason why anybody of any race, sex, walking down Narborough Road could meet somebody in that road who had a view of them because of who they were, not what the uniform they were wearing. So a real challenge for us. This report made us think quite a lot actually because it exposed some of the rub away and cops get jaundiced and cynical because they see life in the raw every day and if you then think it's about you as an individual it starts to it starts to get to you yeah. last few um, i can't do a presentation without george dixon being in it it's a kind of running theme um, an interesting aspect for us particularly dealing with new communities is what does the police mean where where you came from um, the uh, Transparency International Corruption Index is an interesting read. Uh, we come storming in. Imagine if the Eurovision Song Contest, we finished that high up, we'd be thrilled. <laughs> Although, New Zealand are probably in now, aren't they? Australia are in, so New Zealand must have a reason to be in. But, you know, I guess what I would say, and I'm going to talk about complaints in a minute, we are basically a, a pretty ethical kind of group. And yep, there are always some people that aren't. But in terms of public sector corruption, we're a top 10 country. Now, some of the people that come into Leicester come from places where their experience of police could not have been more different. And so we have to work and we have to think about what that is. And that might even have been a generation ago or two generations ago, but just the experience. Um, I, can, I can remember dealing with a case in my previous force which involved the person who fled um, to a foreign country and one morning the detective inspector dealing with the, uh, the case took a phone call and when she picked up her phone uh, it was a person from the police in that country saying we've, um, we've caught him and uh, he's admitted it. When he appeared at Winchester Crown Court he said he admitted it because he was being hung upside down by his ankles and hit with a stick. <laughs> now whether he was or not I don't think I'll ever really know. But it did seem quite different to what the Police and Criminal Evidence Act says about our video recorded cell blocks. Um, and so there's some really interesting stuff there about how can we make, you know, what are they doing in Denmark that means they score, I mean it's not just for policing this, but just as a thought process about what has people's previous experience been of policing or the world that they live in. And you know, we have people come to this city, this city is famed for taking people in and supporting them, yeah. but they come from some pretty brutal places. And the police turning up has all sorts of associations. So, complaints against <coughs> the police. Um, I think I've mentioned already, we take 600,000 calls a year. 1,300 complaints, 14 of them people saying it's because of race, religion and faith. Complaints probably underreported. Lots of those complaints, um, I'll, I'll pick my, I suppose I'll pick my word, lots of those complaints are made by people who we have a considerable history with who we have previously imprisoned and who make all sorts of allegations <coughs> of a process that we then all go through. Some of them are completely legitimate complaints about inappropriate behaviours and we have dismissed people for some of those. But it's really interesting, I think that seems a really low figure to me, out of 600,000 jobs. Is that a lack of faith in the process? Is it people don't know there's a process? Is it people don't believe in the process? We've invested in, uh, in this kit because we want to be transparent about what we do. Every frontline officer and lots of the staff as well have got a personal issue body worn video. It shows what really happened. Um, it's not perfect because it's reliant on when it's turned on and off. But we use body worn video, I mentioned it around stop and search. It's interesting in terms of complaints about who said what to whom. Did this happen? Did that happen? 
I recently personally heard a misconduct case where part of the evidence is now subject to appeal about the decision I came to, so I can't use the footage, but I sat and watched body-worn video footage of what happened and what happened on a journey back to a police station which was probably about 25 minutes worth in total and I sat and watched the whole lot twice through as part of my assessment of what to do with that case. So body-worn video means we're pretty transparent, it means there is a record of what happened it's quite interesting how people react and linking it into the complaints piece uh, I think it's really important about being transparent um, and particularly the case um, in a, a city that's quite complex sometimes last couple now I would say this wouldn't I but we try and take the business of dealing with policing a diverse place quite Seriously, uh, Stonewall LGBT index. We are the top performing police force. My whole point, as I recollect, uh, I can't remember who came second. Doesn't matter who came second. <laughs> uh, we look at things like yeah, and I get the fact these are just these are ways of quality assuring what you're doing. They're about policies and plans and a bit of dip sampling. They're not 100% guarantee that this is how we behave in every contact, in every job, everywhere. But, business in the community, gold standard award. Gender campaign, gold standard award. Royal National Institute for Blind, Employee and Partnership Award. Um, business in the community, race awards. And that was about trying to show our tactical support team. So the vans I mentioned, the vans who we asked to do difficult stuff, Please keep Leicester City Centre safe on a Saturday night. Please put these doors in. Please turn up and walk the line between these people who really don't like each other and both think they have an equal right to express their frustrations with each other. We did a load of work there about positive action and what could we do to make them more diverse, which has been shortlisted. Um, yeah, I would say that, but I, I use it to illustrate the fact that we take the responsibility we have of policing a diverse place really seriously and we try and ask other people to look in on what we do. We have independent advisory groups around key issues. We use them, we take issues to them. We were being inspected earlier and we gave to the inspector, well here's a list of the kind of things we talked about uh, with our independent advisory groups. And they are, I mean, some of you in the room have been involved in them uh, for a long time. Um, they are groups of people who we say, look, this is what we're doing around stop and search, this is what we're trying to do around terrorism, this is what we're doing around hate crime. Pick holes in it. What could we do better? What could we do worse? What works? What doesn't work? Our complaints, we have an ethics committee, which is an independent ethics committee, uh, a couple of academics, a couple of people from the real world, as it were. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who dip, dip sample our complaints and look at our complaints and they come to a view about have we dealt with them in a proportionate, thoughtful way. So we try to externalise what we do um, quite a lot. Um, now that, that's an interesting test to some of the younger members of the audience. Some of you in the audience probably knew him. Some of you in the audience probably remember him selling tyres. Do you remember the tyres in Double Glazing Phase? <laughs> he was Chief of Leicestershire. He's the man that brought traffic wardens to Leicestershire uh, in the late 60s. He went on to be Commissioner of the Met. Um, I turned it into that because I was asked to do a modern version of it. And the thing that struck me in talking to you this evening was I took out the racial prejudice bit. and put social injustice. Because I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about whether social injustice, which could include all sorts of injustices, is a thing that we deal with in policing such a diverse place. Thank you for listening. I'm really happy to take questions. We are challenged sometimes by policing such a diverse place. But we all rather like that challenge. Uh, we feel <coughs> welcomed pretty much everywhere. <coughs> but there are times we get things wrong and that's where we try and police with consent.
and we hope that we have a relationship which means that people can say, do you know what, you've got that one wrong. And that we are big enough to say, mm, thinking about it, I get what you're saying. But, going back to the oath, what we're trying to be is fair. Fair, have some integrity, work hard at it. And by that, you know, I do genuinely believe, and you see it after big things happen, we are the social glue. We draw different communities together by pretty much all of those communities we're perceived as being fair enough to be involved in brokering things, in helping things, and make the city work and make it a better place. So thank you for your support in that. I'm really happy to take questions, especially if they're easy ones.